Great, so this is going to be treatment options for patients with leiomyosarcoma. Um, I don't need to tell this group, but by way of introduction, sarcomas are divided into bone and soft tissue. Uh, within soft tissue, there are many different uh, histological subtypes. Leiomyosarcoma is one of the more common ones. We can um, diagnose leiomyosarcomas in the extremities, blood vessels, uterus, and retroperitoneum, for example. Most studies historically have lumped all of these anatomical sites together, um, and they will often lump uterine and soft tissue leiomyosarcoma together. And I'll try to point out where there are um, particular studies of a, of a subtype. Uh, we now know that uterine and soft tissue leiomyosarcomas are probably genetically or molecularly distinct, but they are more similar to each other than they are to other soft tissue sarcoma subtypes. So there are some commonalities in drug ability. Some data suggests that uterine leiomyosarcomas may be more chemosensitive than the soft tissue counterpart. Um, this, for example, gemcitabine and docetaxel was initially studied in uterine leiomyosarcoma. Um, and I think this is just something to keep in mind as we evaluate the studies. When we talk about treatments for leiomyosarcoma, obviously you can have surgery. There are other treatments that we can use like radiation or some of the things that the interventional radiologists do. I'm going to be focusing on the things that I do as a medical oncologist, so chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. And as we look at these studies, what we are going to evaluate them for are what is the response rate? So what is the chance that the patients, that the tumors um, respond or shrink? What is the survival? So there's two definitions commonly used for survival, progression-free survival, which is how long does it take the disease to grow, and overall survival, how long does someone live? And we have to balance these uh, outcomes with side effects or toxicities and adverse events and quality of life. So here are the studies that I'm going to talk about in a table. Um, and just a few things to point out. Number one, we tend to consider doxorubicin as the uh, one of the most active agents in sarcoma. And, um, however, it's really difficult to find specific activity of doxorubicin and leiomyosarcoma because a lot of the studies of doxorubicin are really old. Uh, I did find one paper, which is what's called a retrospective st study, so it's a look back to get specific leiomyosarcoma activity. Um, in addition, a lot of the studies for doxorubicin are going to be in what's called the frontline or first line setting, so the first drug the patients receive in the advanced setting. Um, and then all of the other drugs like trabectin and aribulin, they all tend to be um, studied after doxorubicin. So not surprisingly, you will see lower response rates when, um, when the tumors have already progressed on, for example, doxorubicin or gemcitabine docetaxel. And finally, not always do we get different responses, response rates for uterine and for soft tissue. So a lot of the studies include both subgroups. Um, I've tried to point out where I can studies that were either specifically in uterine LMS or that they had subgroups or they were stratified for uterine LMS. So let's go back to the drug that uh, your oncologist probably always talks about. Doxorubicin has been around since the 1960s. Broadly speaking, its activity across the board in soft tissue sarcoma is about 15% rate of shrinkage. The higher the dose you get, over 60 milligrams per meter squared, so times your body surface area, the more likelihood for a response. And sometimes we add either ifosfamide or decarbazine. And that increases the chance for response, but does not necessarily impact survival. So the first study I wanted to talk about was this landmark study by the Europeans combining ifosfamide with doxorubicin. When they did that, the response rate essentially doubled to 26%. Um, and there was also an improvement in progression-free survival, so time for tumor growth. There was no difference in how long patients lived overall. That's also probably because after that, patients may have gotten ifosfamide or other drugs. And there is a higher toxicity when you give the drugs together. 
So this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve. It looks at survival. Oops. Um, on the top graph is overall survival. The bottom graph is progression-free survival. In red is doxorubicin alone. In blue is doxorubicin plus ifosfamide. And so from this study, we learned that combining doxorubicin and ifosfamide um, increases the time at it takes for a patient's tumor to grow, but has no impact on survival. The curves here are very close together. Another drug that will get combined with doxorubicin, especially in myomysarcoma, is called decarbazine. This is what's called a retrospective study. So uh, the gold standard for studies is a randomized controlled prospective study where you take 100 patients, 50 are randomized to one drug and 50 to another, and you follow them forward. This was what's called a randomized study where the investigators from Europe looked back at their data to see how did patients do? What were the responses if we gave doxorubicin alone, if we gave doxorubicin ifosfamide, or if we combined it with doxorubicin and decarbazine? And based on this study in specifically Lyomaris sarcoma, it looked like um, doxorubicin plus decarbazine was the winner. It had the highest chance for response, and it had a higher progression-free survival compared to doxorubicin alone. Um, this, the caveat, again, is this is uh, a retrospective study, which means that we can't control for the people that are in each subgroup, so there may be variables or factors that are affecting these outcomes other than uh, the chemotherapy itself. Uh, these are the curves, again, Kaplan-Meier's curves for survival, overall survival. There was no difference whether we used a combination of drugs or uh, doxorubicin alone on overall survival, however, and that's similar to the other study. I added this paper in because this is a novel combination of combining a drug called doxorubicin with another drug called trabectidin, which I'm going to talk to you about in detail in a few more minutes. Um, this was an update presented at ASCO this year, um, and the investigators looked at a population of patients with leiomyosarcoma and gave them doxorubicin and trabectinin, and the response rates were quite high. In uterine leiomyosarcoma, it was almost 60%. So this was one study where they had two subgroups, or it was stratified by uterine or soft tissue. And it seemed like the patients with uterine uh, leiomyosarcoma had a higher response rate to the combination. What is yet to be seen is whether giving the two drugs, so giving doxorubicin plus trabectinin is give, better than giving doxorubicin first and then later on progression giving trabectinin. And that's being studied now in a randomized trial. And that's important because um, we have to balance our outcome again with toxicity and both doxorubicin and trabectinin can affect the heart. And so it'll be interesting and important to know any long-term side effects or toxicities, especially to the heart from this combination. Moving on now to another regimen that is often used, uh, which is gemcitabine-based chemotherapy. Gemcitabine and docet often combined with docetaxel, was first studied in uterine myomysarcoma. And in that initial study by Marty Hunsley, again, the response rate was quite high at 53%. It was then studied in um, other uh, leiomysarcomas and other sarcoma subtypes. This was a study by Dr. Mackey looking at um, whether it's better to give gemcitabine alone or gemcitabine and docetaxel. And this was a study in all sarcoma subtypes. Um, and what was shown was that the response rate appeared higher when you gave the two drugs together than one drug by itself at 8%. What was also confirmed in the study is that this combination works for other sarcomas beyond leiomyosarcoma. And so these are, again, the Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, on the top is progression-free survival. On the bottom is overall survival. In blue is the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel, and in yellow is gemcitabine and alo alone. And it seemed like from this study that the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel was the winner, that patients live longer and have longer time for their tumors to grow if they got the combination. However, there was a subsequent study called the Taxogem study that looked specifically at leiomysarcoma patients. And in that study, there was no difference in survival if you got gemcitabine alone or gemcitabine and docetaxel. 
And this may be due to technical differences in the st how the study was done. Uh, it may be because it was only for leiomyosarcoma. Also, patients had um, only one prior chemotherapy, whereas the study before this, patients were allowed to have uh, no prior chemo or a multiple lines of treatment. So there were some differences in the study. I would say to you, um, as oncologists, I think as sarcoma oncologists, we think that it's probably effective to give gemcitabine alone or gemcitabine and docetaxel together. Uh, we see responses. You know, I, I, it'll depend on uh, risk for toxicity. Sometimes we'll start with gemcitabine and docetaxel, and if there's a lot of neuropathy, we'll leave that and just give the gemcitabine. And so um, you will see both regimens used or both ways of using these drugs. And so this was the tax of gem study, which showed on their Kaplan-Meier curve, no difference in survival uh, if patients were given gemcitabine alone or gemcitabine and docetaxel. So which is better? The, the logical next question is, which is better, doxorubicin and, or gemcitabine and docetaxel? And for a long time, we didn't have an answer to that question. And um, we sort of have one now. Um, this was the JETIS study combining, uh, comparing doxorubicin to gemcitabine and docetaxel in patients with sarcomas or soft tissue sarcomas. And um, in general, patients had similar outcomes. So overall survival, progression-free survival was the same. However, patients who got gemcitabine and docetaxel, it seemed like they had more treatment delays or patient withdrawal. So more patients came off the study. This may be because of um, some of the side effects. And so from this study, doxorubicin was recommended as the preferred first line, but it, that is interchangeable. And we often pick our first line um, based again on the patient in front of us, what, um, what toxicities um, we want to avoid. So if someone has a history of heart dysfunction, we may want to avoid doxorubicin. If someone has um, difficulty with neuropathy from diabetes, for example, we may want to avoid the gemcitabine docetaxel. Uh, and that's usually how we pick regimens. Um, also, if there are any clinical trials that are upcoming, that sort of is how we decide what to use first. So those are largely the drugs that we pick first. Um, then after that, there are the uh, other drugs that are also considered active in leiomyosarcoma. And the first drug I can talk about is one that has been extensively studied. It's a chemotherapy called trabectidin or Yandelis. Um, it is a marine-derived alkaloid, had a lot of uh, initial studies, but the large phase three study, so large randomized controlled trial, um, was a study in patients with leiomyosarcoma and liposarcomas. Patients were randomized to receive either trabectidin or decarbazine, and this study showed that progression-free survival was longer with trabectidin than it was with decarbazine. And however, there was no yeah, better. I can't do it. You need to do it yourself. Okay. In 2015, this drug, trabectidin, was approved for patients with leiomyosarcomas and liposarcomas. And this is the Kaplan Meier progression free survival curve. And you see the winner is the blue line, which is trabectidin. At the same time of this study, another drug called aribulin was being investigated in a very similar fashion. Aribulin is a um, Micro, what's called a microtubule inhibitor. It was studied uh, very similarly in a phase three study in liposarcoma and leiomyosarcoma, and patients were randomized to receive aribulin or decarbazine. However, this study sort of had the opposite results. There was no progression-free survival difference between the two, no response rate difference between the two. There was an overall survival benefit. So the overall survival in the aribulin group was 13.5 months, and in the, in the um, decarbazine group was 11.5 months. And so this drug did get FDA approval. However, it was only FDA approved in liposarcoma. And that was because later on in a subset analysis of the leiomyosarcoma patients only, that overall survival benefit did not uh, hold up, but we still will from time to time use iribulin, and I'll show you in a little bit some novel combinations of uh, iribulin and myomysarcoma. Moving now to targeted therapies. So targeted therapies are drugs that block certain proteins. 
uh, usually growth signaling proteins. And for example, this drug called pizopinib is uh, what's called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It blocks the proteins VEGF and PDGF R. This was uh, an important study for sarcoma because drugs that are similar to pizopinib, things like serafinib, sutinitinib, bevacizumab, had previously been studied broadly in soft tissue sarcomas and did not have the success that pizopinib did. Uh, so this was at, you know, sort of going beyond chemotherapy for patients with sarcomas. And so it sort of opened a whole new pathway of treatment. Um, there was a phase three study that looked at pizopinib in all sarcoma subtypes and compared that to placebo. In the patients who got pizopinib, their disease did not grow longer than patients who got placebo. This was 4.6 versus 1.6 months. The response rate in all sarcoma subtypes was about 6%. 44% of patients with lyomyosarcoma sarcoma had stable disease at 12 weeks. So currently pizopinib is FDA approved for patients who have previously received chemotherapy for all soft tissue sarcoma subtypes except one called liposarcoma, um, but we will use it in lyomyosarcoma sarcoma based on this data. And this is the progression-free survival curve. In green is pizopinib, in red is placebo, and it shows you um, that uh, at the very first assessment, patients on placebo, their tumors started growing. Switching gears now to immunotherapy, because that's um, one of the fields that is very, developing very quickly in sarcoma. So when we talk about immunotherapy, we can talk about a number of things, but largely many of the studies that have occurred to date in sarcoma have been around what are called checkpoint inhibitors or PD-1 inhibitors. So sort of drugs that take the break off the immune system. Examples of these drugs are things like pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and these drugs have shown activity in cancers like melanoma and kidney cancer. So the first study was of pembrolizumab in um, sarcoma, soft tissue sarcoma and bone sarcomas. This was called the SARC-028 study. Um, there were 40 patients with soft tissue sarcomas. The overall response rate was 18%. There were actually no responses in patients with lyomyosarcoma sarcoma to pembrolizumab, um, but six out of 10 patients had stable disease. The majority of responses were seen in patients with this different kind of sarcoma called undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. This is what's called a waterfall plot. So it plots out each patient and shows what happened to them on study. And if the bar is above the baseline, that means their tumor grow, grew. And if it's below the baseline, their tumor shrunk. On studies, 30% shrinkage is what is called success. So all of these patients here had success, and you can see that these red bars were those patients, and they mostly had what's called undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. In purple are the lyomyosarcomas, sarcomas, and so this is this group here. And these patients had either minor shrinkage of their tumor or minor growth of their tumor, and that's considered stable. So it's important to know when you evaluate clinical trials that response is defined by 30% reduction. So in reality, when we're seeing a patient though, we can tell you your tumor shrunk, um, and it may have shrunk by 10% or 15% or may have shrunk by a centimeter. Uh, and so that's good news, but that doesn't meet the definition of response uh, on a clinical trial. There was a subsequent study by Dr. George, which looked at specifically at uterine lyomyosarcoma and the PD-1 or checkpoint inhibitor called nivolumab. This study was stopped early because none of the first 12 patients who were enrolled had a response. Um, and so it did not continue to enroll for other patients. And then there was Dr. D'Angelo's study of um, nivolumab versus nivolumab and ipilimumab. Uh, ipilimumab is another drug that's an immunotherapy. It inhibits another uh, checkpoint, CTLA-4. This study was not designed to, com to compare nivolumab or nivolumab and ipilimumab, but there were 29 myomysarcoma patients, three of whom had a response. Two of them were in the combination. So largely the work that's going on right now is to try and figure out why certain patients are responding to immunotherapy and why the response to immunotherapy is not that great in lyomysarcoma. These tend to be in 
on, in the lab, they look like inflammatory tumors, so they look like they would respond. Um, but for some reason, we're not seeing the response rates that you would see in melanoma or kidney cancer. And so one such um, pathway is this study by Dr. Wilkie, which is looking at a drug called axitinib. Axitinib is a VEGF inhibitor like pazopinib. And there's some data to suggest that VEGF in, in inhibits immune responses in, in the tumor. And so in this study, uh, axitinib, which blocks VEGF, was given in combination with pembrolizumab. And this study was a success. At 12 weeks, over 65% of patients, tumors did not grow. And one patient with leiomyosarcoma had a response. And again, this is a waterfall plot. Um, and the patients uh, who uh, are below, uh, whose bar are going below the baseline have um, a response, especially if their tumor shrunk more than uh, 30%. So let's now move to some ASCO updates. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that, just a couple minutes. Um, one of the interesting combinations that were present, was presented this year specifically for leiomyosarcoma was a combination of that drug aribulin with uh, another drug called linvatinib. Linvatinib is also like pazopinib and axitinib. It's an angiogenesis or VEGF inhibitor. And this combination was studied and had a very impressive response rate of 28.5%. Um, you should know that some of the patients had never received prior treatment and that may confound the results because I told you the, the earlier you receive a treatment, the more likely you're going to have a response. Um, but I think this is intriguing data and we'll look forward to seeing uh, further updates on this combination. Another pub publication or another study by Dr. Nathanson was combining aribulin again with Keytruda or pembrolizumab um, and using the aribulin to, to, to modulate the immune microenvironment and make pembrolizumab to work better. 42%, um, and this was again in specifically in leiomyosarcoma. So the study is ongoing for many different sarcoma subtypes, but they reported on the cohort of patients with leiomyosarcoma. 42% did not have progression of disease at 12 weeks, but that did not meet their predetermined bar of success, which was something I think like 60%. Um, so I don't think this combination is going to move forward in this in leiomyosarcoma, but um, I'm sure they're going to look at uh, reasons why certain patients had benefit and did not. A few other drugs presented at ASCO. We've heard a lot to date about apatinib and enlotinib. Uh, mostly from our colleagues in Asia. Uh, these, and Lotinib especially has um, a publication in which there was a very high disease control rate of 70 over 70%, specifically in leiomyosarcoma, 75% uh, of patients didn't progress at 12 weeks. Um, so a lot of interest in these drugs. Currently, I believe there's a study um, comparing Lotinib to decarbazine, so that'll be an important study um, to consider. And then um, another pathway or what is what's called checkpoint inhib sorry, um, CDK4 inhibitors. CDK4 regulate cell, regulate cell cycle progression, so mitosis and DNA synthesis. Um, and these drugs block uh, the cell cycle progression, causing cell cycle arrest. And there were a couple of studies uh, preliminary studies looking at ribostecleb, uh, which is a CDK4 inhibitor. This drug is already being used or similar drugs in liposarcoma. So the idea is to broaden its scope. Um, that's what I had for you today. I hope I did okay on time. Um, You're and doing great. All right, let's, let's check the chat box and see what's there. Um, someone says, Tiffany says, glad you're doing this. <laughs> Uh, any, any questions now? You can unmute yourself and ask questions as long as they're not individual about your situation, but more general. So go ahead, Anne. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much, Dr. Mova. Can you speak to, you know, I'm not as familiar with the medical lingo, but it seems like some of these studies, particularly in the immunotherapy, are great for other cancers except for LMS. What are you seeing as hope for, for LMS patients. Um, there are more treatment options, but can you speak to where you see opportunities for us in, in terms of hope? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I think it's perplexing to us as well as to why immunotherapy works in melanoma and why not in sarcoma. And then more specifically, why aren't we seeing patients with LMS getting those types of responses? Especially because there are a plethora of papers saying they have the right proteins, what's called PDL1, to get a response. So I will answer your question in sort of what we're doing at MSK, what I'm doing, some of the research paths that we think are interesting. Um, one is uh, looking at immunotherapy combinations. Um, we have a few studies combining these drugs like Keytruda or uh, Pembrolizumab or Nivolumab uh, with other drugs that we hope will boost the immune system. So for example, in LMS, there tends to be an abundance of something called macrophages in the immune environment. And these are a type of cells that might block the immune response. And so one of the clinical trials we have ongoing is a drug called, a drug that blocks uh, that pathway and may help boost the immune system. Um, all of our studies are banking specimens. And so I, we think that that's really important and we're really grateful for patients giving us their tissue at baseline or on treatment and agreeing to biopsies because I think that's the way we're gonna answer the question is to why are there some responders and no responders. So a few of our studies are combining Keytruda or nivolumab or pembrolizumab and nivolumab with other drugs to try and elicit a better immune response, especially in leiomyosarcoma. It's one of the avenue, one of the questions that we have. Other considerations are how do we make chemotherapy better? How do we make it less toxic? Over the last few years, there's been a lot of interest in how to make doxorubicin less toxic, how to make iphosphamide loss less toxic. And so we're looking at that plus combining those drugs with immunotherapy. And then um, targeted therapy. So all of these um, angiogenesis inhibitors and VEGF inhibitors, there's a plethora of data here. And so um, I, I, I think your point is val valid for somebody who's looking at it and uh, differently, like what is the winner? Which, where are we going in this field? I think for now we're exploring all of these um, pathways. And I think that's really hopeful that we have all, all these studies that are ongoing. And then as we see that there's uh, some signal of activity, these will be moved forward into broader studies um, to, to look for um, something that could get FDA approved, for example. Great. Thank you. I'm a patient at MSK, so thank you. You're welcome. So there's a few more questions in the chat box. Um, will the slides be available to us? I will definitely make a recording of this so you can see the slides in the recording. Um, if you, Winnie wants to know, if you tried two different drugs separately and they didn't work, is there any point of trying them together in a combination? Good question. Um, not usually. Um, we need data to show that there's synergy. Uh, and synergy is different than an additive effect, right? So additive just means that you're gonna, synergy simply, syn synergy means that they're gonna play off one another and therefore you're gonna get a higher response rate um, by combining them. A lot of times we are limited by toxicity and being able to combine drugs together. And so I, wouldn't say to do that without data to back it up. So things like doxorucin and ifosamide that are combined together, gemcitabine and docetaxel have shown to be safe to combine together um, and that they may um, increase response rate. So for example, docetaxel by itself doesn't really work that well in sarcoma, but when combined with gemcitabine, it seems like there's an increase in activity. So that's where an example of that. Um, I guess without knowing the specific drugs, it would be hard for me to answer, but that's that's the gist of it. Uh, can you see the chat box, Dr. Mova? I'm gonna Let's go see. there. I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen maybe, so that way I can... Um... Okay, I will read it to you. Let's see, how long is the effectiveness of Pazinup, I can never say it, Pazopanib, yeah. after three cycles of doxorubicin plus ifosamide chemotherapy. So how long is the effectiveness of um, Voltrient? <laughs> so 
the data I presented you was average, and the average was about four months before tumors started growing. But within in that study and within our own anecdotal experience, there are patients for whom they can be on it for eight months or a year. It varies from patient to patient. So average is is average, right? It's the it's everybody divided by the n, but um, it'll sort of specifically it will vary from patient to patient. But the average is about four months. Okay, Caitlin. My I'm muted. Yeah, Caitlin asked. Um, let me just pull this up a little farther. I think I missed it. Okay, there seems to be a shift away from MSI as an indicator for immunotherapy response to TMB, which I don't know what those are. Since LMS is typically a low TMB, is a um, solid tumor. Where do you see immunotherapy falling? into place for treatment strategies. Do you feel that TMB might still hold for immunotherapies that are not PD-L1 and PD-1 based? Okay, so to backtrack a little bit about what those words mean, yeah. um, in other cancers, we can sometimes predict response to these checkpoint inhibitors like nivolumab and pembrolizumab. So for example, in lung cancer, if a tumor has 50% PD-L1 expression, those tumors are going to respond to immunotherapy. That hasn't really been shown in sarcoma yet. Part of it is we have a smaller sample size of responders and non-responders. Tumor mutational burden, or TMB, is when you look at tumors um, DNA and see how many alterations there are. And tumors with high tumor mutational burden, again, are going to respond better to immunotherapy. Caitlin's point is that as a whole, sarcomas tend to have an average TMB of two. So they look like as a whole, um, it, they may not respond as well to immunotherapy. But again, that's average. So there are some times we get surprised and we'll, we'll look for these on um, these genomic profiling tests. The, an institution may do their own genomic profiling or sometimes your tumor is sent out to Foundation Medicine or Keras um, and they'll give back information on PDL1 and TMB. And sometimes we'll get back that someone's TMB is very high. And so we think we get excited and say, okay, um, they may respond to immunotherapy. There are other things that also may um, indicate responsiveness to immunotherapy, something called mismatch repair, um, high mismatch repair, uh, or loss of mismatch repair proteins. So mismatch repair proteins help fix um, DNA errors. And so if there's a loss of those proteins, it's thought that those tumors, again, are going to be genomically complex and respond to immunotherapy. Again, unfortunately, in soft tissue sarcoma, that doesn't happen a lot. It happens in about 2% of patients, but we still find them. So that's why we do these extra genomic profiling tests to see if we can find someone. So right now, where's the role of immunotherapy? We don't use those tests really to say that immunotherapy is not going to work for you in sarcoma. We may get back a result and get really excited and say immunotherapy is going to be more likely to work for you if you have MSI high, microsatellite instability high, or mismatch repair. But if your numbers are low, that is typical of sarcoma. And in within that subgroup of low, there are still patients who respond and don't respond. And I think the current question is, if it's not TMB, if it's not PDL1, what is it? Why are certain patients not responding? Why are certain patients responding? And that may be related to um, T cell infiltration, what's called T regulatory cells, other things that may be uh, that we need to delineate. And so what is the role of immunotherapy? I think your best role for a patient with LMS and immunotherapy is to see if you can get on a clinical trial of one of these novel combinations because Clearly, we know that nivolumab and pembrolizumab by themselves didn't really elicit a, a robust response. So mm -hmm. if you can get on a clinical trial trying to explore this, um, you may have a better chance at a response, and we can get tissue and study this further to then help the next person down the line. Okay, thank you. Winnie says, does targeted therapy only work if you have the targeted gene mutation? Uh, yes, sometimes and, and no sometimes. So there are certain drugs. Um, the easiest example is GIST tumors. Uh, 
Um, if you have a mutation in the gene called KIT, you're going to respond to imatinib or Gleevec. The reason I gave that example is because GIST is a type of sarcoma, but there are other examples in melanoma, BRAF mutations, something called NTRAC. Um, there's a drug called larotrectinib that works very well for people who have an NTRAC alteration. Um, it's a great drug. There are then these dirty targeted therapies, um, things like I just showed you, pazopinib, um, axitinib, um, linvatinib, which are what are targeted, th consider targeted therapies, but they have multiple targets. So VEGF, PDGFR. And so we don't have to test or we haven't shown that testing for VEGF or PDGFR affects outcome to date. We don't really know, again, why some people respond or don't respond. So for those drugs or the dirtier um, targeted therapies, they are just broadly used. Okay. Is cryoablation a viable option for a radiation-induced LMS that has reoccurred? Yeah, so we didn't talk about the local treatment options. We think of local treatments as surgery, radiation, and I said some of the things that interventional radiologists do. So burning tumors, RFA, cryoablation, freezing tumors, embolization, blocking off supply to the liver. I think it'll depend on the specific situation. Um, what has been done before, what other options are there. Um, it, there isn't a lot of data outside of a specific sarcoma called desmoid tumors um, for cryoablation, but it is a tool in the toolkit and there may be a role for it depending on the situation. Okay, Catherine asks, is there any indication of CITIS of the primary tumor other than the uterus impacts effectiveness of specific drugs on LMS? or is there not enough data? Yeah, I think the jury's out. I think there was some examples I gave like gemcitabine and docetaxel. Um, look like it was more sensitive in uterine LMS, but then if you look at trabectidin, the outcomes are sort of the same, whether it's uterine or soft tissue. So I think it depends on the drug um, and not all of them have been studied specifically as uterine versus not, especially things like doxorubicin, because doxorubicin was studied in the 70s and 80s, a lot of the studies on response rate. I tried to go back and see if I could find a paper specifically on LMS, and it's really hard to tease that, that data out. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you use gent uh, gemicide, gem gemocytobine in long infusions, three hours, or in short infusions, 30 minutes, like other non-sarcoma tumors. There are some data, there is some data that long infusions work better in sarcoma. So yeah, I, we use the, I tend to use the 900 milligrams per meter squared dose, which was the papers presented by Dr. Hens, uh, published by Dr. Hensley. And in those papers, they use 10 milligrams per minute. So you end up at 90 minutes um, because of the suggestion that that works better in sarcoma, which is different than in pancreas cancer. Okay, how long is the effectiveness of doxorubicin plus ifosamide in chemotherapy? Um, how many cycles should be given? Sorry, I need my glasses. How many cycles should be given to get the best results? We have already had um so it's going to depend again patient to patient i would just keep re-imaging seeing what the um what the rate of response is often we end up giving six cycles of doxorubicin and ifosfamide because doxorubicin is the toxicity from doxorubicin to the, the heart can increase after six cycles. So we sort of do a check-in at that point and then make decisions about further treatment or not. But it's gonna vary. The how long is the effectiveness question is difficult to answer because it's gonna vary from person to person. Okay, as you know, a lot of us have the TP53 mutation and Mary asks, which drug is best for that? Uh, try Sorry, which, where are we? Which drug is best for T oh, P53 mutation? Yeah, so a very frequent alteration in leiomyosarcoma is P53. Other commonly seen alterations are RB uh, loss. Um, there isn't a specific drug um, for P53 alterations at present. Um, there are drugs 
that are looking at the pathway in other ways, but there really isn't a specific drug for P53 at present. We just, lyomal sarcoma, um, LMSDR just supported some uh, research on that with SARC. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get some information. Right. Um, let's see, the next question. Can you please repeat the names of the drugs you recommended for the NTRK mutations, presuming it would apply to NTRK2? Uh, Lara Trectinet, mm -hmm. and it was a paper in New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. Is Keytruda and Timidar a good combination? Um, so Temidar, temozolomide is a drug like decarbazine. Um, I'm trying to think if I know, I don't know combinations in sarcoma myself of Keytruda and Temidar, but that's not to say that someone hasn't combined it. A lot of, there's a lot of um, sort of case series or anecdotal data when it comes to immunotherapy. And so it may have been combined or reported. I just don't know um, of that combination. Okay. Caitlin asks a good question. What factors are taken into account when deciding or choosing a fifth line of therapy? Okay, so fifth line tends to be, let's say, usually after doxorubicin, gem, let's count, pizopinib, trabectidin. Um, so that's usually the point we sometimes look back and say, hey, was there any drug that elicited a response and we stopped for other reasons. So sometimes doxorubicin gets stopped because a patient um, had a response, but then we hit six cycles. <laughs> or sometimes gemcitabine and taxotere, docetaxel gets stopped because of neuropathy. So we sometimes say maybe we can reuse some of these drugs or in novel ways. Um, clinical trials, of course, and how the patient is doing, um, what's called their performance status, how uh, active they are, how, um, how able they are to be able to receive the next type of treatment and, and side effect profiles. Okay, great. Uh, Liz asks, when considering adjuvant chemotherapy, docs and decarb, post a successful surgery, okay, after that, I have a few, I've had a few people say to be careful not to waste chemo on your body your body can only take so much. Is this a valid concern? Still new and learning. Thank you for all the info. Great a question. Um, that brings us into a topic I did not discuss, which is adjuvant or after surgery, uh, which is a very controversial topic. So your question, even though you're still learning, uh, I don't have a perfect answer for your question. Um, the, the concept of adjuvant chemotherapy or after surgery is debatable and constantly debated even within our own group. Um, and so if the first question is, is adjuvant chemotherapy warranted? And there have been studies which um, say that it improves survival in some patients and a lot of studies that say that adjuvant, so after surgery chemotherapy does not improve survival. And then the second question is what drugs to use. Unfortunately, the best drugs we have, so doxorubicin and ifosfamide, still only marginally improve survival. It's at about 10 or 11%. So this discussion becomes a risk benefit discussion. It really depends how high risk you are for the sarcoma to come back versus um, the side effects and whether you'd be able to tolerate the chemo. I don't really like the, I, the wording of not say, picking on you at all. I, I just don't like someone to say that you're wasting chemo because the idea is that um, you never want the sarcoma to come back and you never want to have to use chemotherapy again. So I don't think you're wasting chemo and ideally if it ever came back, there would be better drugs and newer drugs and more options. So I don't think that you're, I don't think you're wasting anything. It's just a careful discussion about risk and benefit, whether it's really warranted and whether the side effects are warranted for the benefit. Okay, I lost you, Sharon, but I think the question, I don't know if everybody else can't hear you. That's because I was muted when I read it. Okay. <laughs> Catherine asked again, my question about Sudis, or Sudis, I'm not sure I'm saying it right, was actually specifically about non-uterine LMS. Mm 
is there any data on certain drugs being better depending on the location of the primary tumor? Thank you. Um, not at present, no. There's not enough patients to stratify. I wish we could do a study of um, you know, uterus versus extremity versus some of the less common subtypes, um, but there really isn't that data. Okay. If trabectidin stopped working during a break, is it likely to work again if you start back? Yep, it could work. Uh, I think it's still reasonable to, uh, to reconsider. Okay. Carolyn asks, what is the preferred method of imaging to look for new term tumors? Measure size of existing tumors or determine what type of mass is present without doing a biopsy. Would that be a CT, a PET, an MRI? Okay. Also, um, a data list field, meaning that the optimal way to surveil patients long term hasn't really been proven. Um, and that's because it's difficult to say, to run a prospective randomized trial. So, you people, you 50 patients will get a chest x ray, and you 50 patients will get a CT scan, and you'll get it at two month intervals, and you get it at three month intervals. So, it's because it's difficult to, to do that, um, we tend to use consensus and best practice. I will say it's difficult to be doing PET scans given the cost and the degree of radiation. Um, every three months. And so generally we fall back on CT scans, especially for the lungs. The CT scans tend to be the best test for the lungs. MRI for the local tumor if it's in the extremity. Again, it depends on risk. The, high, the higher the stage of the tumor, the more intense the surveillance may be. If someone presented with a very small tumor and very low likelihood of a recurrence than, than just maybe physical exam and chest x-ray may be appropriate. Okay, great. Is there any targeted drug for CDK2 gene mutation? We tried Palbase or BAS, which was ineffective. Yeah, Palbasicle. So there's a few emerging drugs um, to target this pathway, not something, not Yet, um, I don't think FDA approved for any cancer to the last, to, to best of my knowledge, but something that we could explore in sarcoma as they um, are looked at in other cancers. Okay, Mary asked, what about, oh boy, here's a big word, uh, cabazinib and uh, Timdor together? Pazopinib? Yeah, no, no. C A B O Z A N Tinib. Cabozantinib, maybe? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah, so cabozantinib has some data suggesting benefit in some sarcoma subtypes, some small studies. Um, I'm not aware of data of cabozantinib plus temidar. Um, okay. Let's see, I emailed this one, but typed it as well. Is there evidence of efficacy of amputation after local recurrence in LMS of the extremities? Um, so I think this is gonna be a very specific, it's gonna end up being a specific scenario question. And I think yeah. it would depend on the, the situation. Okay, can you explain the difference between Doxorubicin and Doxel, the pros and cons of each? Good question. So um, Doxel is what's called a pegylated version of Doxorubicin and thought to preferentially um, release drug at tumor site and has less free radical formation, so less likely to cause heart toxicity. So they have different toxicities. Um, Doxorubicin has more blood count issues, risk for heart toxicity. Doxel may have more risk for allergic reaction and hand foot syndrome. In terms of efficacy, they're probably the same, but by convention, most because all of the large studies and doxorubicin has always been sort of the de facto standard of care when comparing drugs, a lot of the phase three trials that we do these days are always decarbazine as the standard of care, not doxel. We tend to use doxorubicin by convention or by just by what we do. Okay, any more questions? You can unmute yourself. 
or type them in either way. I'll give you a second here. Um, I have a question. We usually have a debate going on about biopsies. And some of us feel like a lot of times they're not necessary and that their risk could be um, to seed the track where the biopsy needle went yeah. um, and not wanting to disturb the tumor at all. Um, do you have an opinion about that? I think biopsies, I'm a pro biopsy person. I think you get information. I think that if you are having biopsies or even your surgery at a reputable institution, that that is, especially in the United States, most institutions in the United States are going to be reputable institutions, that that seeding idea is unlikely to happen. They're going to be very careful with doing the biopsy. I think for the primary site, we definitely need the information. We're talking about a rare tumor. We definitely need good tissue to be able to confirm the diagnosis. I would never want to say this might be a lyomyosarcoma sarcoma or it might be this type of sarcoma and then um, carry on with our treatment because knowing what type of sarcoma we have may rule in and rule out some from some drugs. We just heard that trabectidin is FDA approved for lyomyosarcoma sarcoma and not for other sarcomas. So um, and some clinical trials these days are specific to certain subtypes of sarcoma. So you definitely want to have enough tissue to be able to confidently know the subtype of sarcoma. Sometimes we may get more tissue for genomic profiling, for looking for these mutations or other out-of-the-box novel treatments. Um, and sometimes on studies, we may um, require biopsies to sort of look at why people are responding or not. In that case, the biopsy may not help you directly. And so I could understand reservation. Um, but it will help the development of future trials. And so that's important. In terms of safety, we always try to do the most accessible site. Obviously, if you have a lung tumor and a tumor that we can see on the arm, for example, we're gonna biopsy the one on the arm, the most, the most easier, the easiest to biopsy. And then we sort of go down the hierarchy. And it always has to be safe. If something is too small to biopsy um, or just looks very dangerous to biopsy, then we would forego it. And that's a risk benefit discussion. Winnie wants to know, Winnie gets the points for the most questions. Any point of trying Doxel if Doxel Rubinson didn't work? No, I don't think so. I, I would consider them largely equal. Okay. Is there any validity to have another genetic profile done on a metastatic site or recurrent site if there was one done on the primary tumor? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it's a great scientific question. Certainly, um, there are tumors like GIST where we know that mutations can change. There can be resistance to drugs. A lot of times we're limited by cost because the payer is not going to pay for multiple genomic profiling. So I would say right now in 2020, I probably would not be by doing genomic profiling on multiple metastatic sites. Um, but I, you know, if there's a specific question, then I think that that's okay. I, I think if there's a specific question, sometimes we'll do that on a clinical trial just to look and see um, if, if certain pathways have been turned on or off based on the treatments that patients have gotten previously. That is the theory, and we've seen that in other cancers. We haven't proven, proven it to a full extent in lyomyosarcoma, sarcoma, um, and it's difficult uh, to get to be able to do it functionally I also. So I have a question, I'll just butt in here. <laughs> What's your take on using um, aromatase inhibitors for estrogen and progesterone positive tumors adjuvantly? Ah. Oh, so actually the, adjuvantly and if there is a tumor. So the next question was about ERPR, so I'm gonna add them both together. So the question was, can a biopsy for ERPR testing be done? You probably don't need an additional biopsy, just they can probably just quickly test it for ERPR on, a, or on the previous specimen. Um, and then really there's no data to use it. I wouldn't use it adjuvantly and I wouldn't recommend adjuvant use in the metastatic setting for slow growing, 
um, leiomyosarcomas that are estrogen positive. If you've tried other therapies, I think it's reasonable to try based on Dr. George's study, which did show that there was some stabilization of disease, understanding that the response rate is not very high. I think for patients whose tumors are growing quickly, it's probably not going to be enough, but there are, uh, there are certainly some patients I've used it before and it has caused stabilized, stabilization of disease. I'm going to skip the next question because I think we've already answered that about doxorubicin and doxel. Um, in the biopsy, what is the relevance of primary tumor? If there's metastasis, does it really matter where is the primary? Um, yeah, I think we, I, I mean, I see your point. You're, you're going to get treated, but I think we want to know where the primary we tend to want to know where the primary tumor is. I don't usually come into an instance where we don't know where the primary tumor is for leiomyosarcoma. So it's difficult for me to answer that question without um, imagining a scenario where that would happen. But truth, to answer the question about the drug, the drugs are probably going to work or not work. Whether as, um, and, it, and because we don't have data to suggest at this point that the site is going to dictate your treatment, that probably doesn't matter now. Okay. So I have a question. What drugs are coming down the pipeline? Um, so um, we have some trials of, as I was saying, of immunotherapy combinations. We have um, uh, one pathway that I'm personally exploring is what's called PARP inhibitors or DNA damage repair, the DNA damage repair pathway. So we have a few trials um, looking at those drugs specifically in leiomyosarcoma. Um, we have studies of chemotherapies that are like doxorubicin um, that are going to be, um, you know, trying to get at less toxicity, things like that. Um, so it's sort of all what we're, what we're researching in um, and trying to run these clinical trials right now. And hopefully um, we can see some signals of response and maybe move them forward. <clears throat> Is it okay to ask a question? Yeah, can, I? can I ask a question? Hello. Yeah, go ahead and ask it. I was muted. All right. With multiple uh, metastases, uh, is there more hope in CRISPR-9 or CAR T-cell therapy uh, rather than just individual uh, treating each metastasis? So um, to date, CAR T-cell treatment options in, in sarcoma is difficult to come across for a clinical trial. All of these treatment options that I've talked to you about, though, are systemic therapies, so should target all of them. We didn't get into other immunotherapy approaches like autologous T-cell transfers, CAR T-cells, vaccines. I think these are all research things that are in, in, in investigation. And if you can get on a clinical trial for one of these uh, concepts, then I think that that's great. Um, Would it be best to use the right to try? Well, you can, but we need specific drugs for leiomyosarcoma. So, um, so CAR T cells directed against leiomyosarcoma or autologous T cell for leiomyosarcoma First, we need to show that something is specifically active, and then we, you know, then I would say, okay, we could use right to try. So, for example, there's a, there's NYESO that we target um, that has been actively studied in synovial sarcoma or myxoid liposarcomas, um, but there's only a subset of patient. That's a subset of patients with sarcoma, and within sarcoma, a subset of patients with certain what's called HLA subtypes. So, I think. You know, we need more data before we can invoke right to try in this instance. Okay, so okay. I have a question. Um, we just had a recent webinar. Might mute it. No, we had a recent webinar with Dr. Um, Kristen Ganju at Stanford on clinical trials, and she suggested um, that people before they 
use a lot of different chemos to look at clinical trials because some of the standard ones are being combined. Yeah. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think you always should look at what's, what clinical trials are going on. Um, so most clinical trials that are ongoing right now are in the after the first line setting. So second line or third line setting. Um, but you're right. So for example, we have a study combining immunotherapy with gemcitabine. And so if you've had gemcitabine before, you're not going to be eligible for that study. So clinical trials are sort of everywhere and I, in, in the paradigm from the beginning to, to, to your eighth line of therapy. Um, we, yeah. Yeah, great. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending your time with us and educating us about the different chemotherapies and uh, trials that you have. I, I recently shared a, a, a tweet that you're going to be focusing on a lot of LMS trials as in your career at uh, Sloan Ketterling. So we just want to thank you. Can everybody give her an applause? Yay! Virtual applause! <laughs> So thank you very, very much. And I will make this recording available to others, okay? Yeah, all right. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.